Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about beginning Irish research. Now, this is particularly for people who have Irish immigrants who have come to the United States. Now, if you're immigrants, um, Irish immigrants came to Canada, um, went to Australia, went elsewhere, um, some of the methodology that we're going to talk about today will certainly apply, but um, we're going to talk specifically about um, Irish immigrants to the United States. Now, one of the things that you need to be aware of when we talk about uh, beginning Irish research um, is that it, this is, I've been trying to figure out how to say this. So those of you who are new to family history, um, maybe you might want to spend some time researching some other lines in your family history. Irish research is kind of like a 200 or maybe even a 300 level genealogy skill, um, whereas um, some of the other things that you might be doing might be 100 or 200 level skills if you kind of equate it to like college courses. Irish research is, is a little bit more difficult. At the end of our presentation today, we'll talk about very specifically some of the challenges in Irish research. However, that doesn't mean that it's not doable. I tell you that just to give you um, a, an accurate expectation, not to scare you away. So um, just be aware that some of the things we're going to talk about are a little bit more advanced genealogy methodology skills, but they're certainly doable and there's certainly things that you can learn. And one of the words of caution I want to give you is don't just try to jump to the easy things when you're researching your Irish family because um, you know if you skip over some of the more difficult steps what you're gonna find is that you might end up tracing the wrong family very very easy to do in Irish research if you don't follow the steps so today we're going to talk about specifically about um, things you can do in the U.S. to make sure that when you get to Irish records you're tracing the right family. Um, and then on Thursday we will take a look more specifically at the, at the Irish records that are available on Ancestry.com specifically to help you locate your family in Ireland. So all of the stuff we're going to talk about today is preliminary and then we'll talk about getting into the Irish records in, in more detail on Thursday. Okay, with that introduction, let's dive in. We have quite a bit to cover today. Some of this um, information is not going to be new to you. It's going to be stuff that you um, have heard from me before, but I think it's important that we make sure that we repeat some of these things. I learn best by repetition. Hopefully you do as well. One of the things that I'm going to encourage you to do is always to start with census records. Start with some of those foundational records look for patterns, make sure you've got your family in all of the census records. Now, if your family came um, into the, well, if your family was in the United States after 1900, specifically the 1900, 1910, um, 1920 censuses have an immigration year listed on them. So even if your ancestor came in 1860 or 1870, that immigration year will still be on those later censuses if they were still alive at the time. Look for that information about their naturalization status. Look at the birthplaces of their children. See if those are recorded consistently. If they immigrated as adults or after they were married, they may have had a child or two born in Ireland, and that gives you further information to start collecting. If they were naturalized, you're going to want to go look for those papers next. Remember, you want to get the complete naturalization packet, not just that certificate, because that packet often lists information very specifically about the date, the port and the ship of arrival. Now, if your ancestor came in the 1840s um, during the Irish potato famine, if they came in the 1860s or 70s, those passenger lists aren't going to have a lot more information. But if they came after 1880, 1890, those passenger lists started getting more and more detailed. Also included in that um, naturalization paperwork is often going to be the name of the spouse and the children, sometimes even their birth dates and places. Specific, what you're looking for is a location in Ireland. So if you anywhere you can look to find that information, that's going to be useful. Now again, if your family came in the middle or late 1800s, you're going to have to get a little bit more creative. So let's um, just, we'll talk about some of those more creative things. Let me just finish reviewing some information about naturalization and, paper and, and passenger lists. Passenger lists, the late 1800s, early 1900s, sometimes included birthplace, and maybe even the last residence where they lived. Those two things are not always the same, so pay attention to that. 
Um, pay attention, and this works even if your family came in, in the 1840s, pay attention to who they're traveling with. Look at the people that are also on the ship. Get familiar with some of those last names. Maybe um, print off a copy of, of that passenger list or start a spreadsheet so that you know who those people are. If you start to see some of those same people show up on census records as neighbors, or if you start to see them show up um, in church records as, as other fellow congregants, it's possible that those people um, migrated with your ancestor, not just happened to be on the same ship, but actually were a cluster of people migrating from the same place to the same place. So sometimes you have to think a little bit more broadly than just your family or your ancestor. Pay attention to those other names, the names of neighbors on census records and the names of fellow passengers. Um, what I do is I just keep a spreadsheet of the surnames so that I, and I look at it once in a while when I'm researching a particular immigrant family just so that those names are kind of top of mind so that as I look at other records, as I look at you know, census records in particular right now, um, if, I, if those names come up, I can compare. You know, is this John O'Sullivan who was on the boat the same John O'Sullivan who was living three houses away on the census? Do they have the same age? Were they born in the same place? Do they have the same wife's name? That starts to help me make some of those connections. And that's what you really need to be thinking about when you're doing Irish research. Don't just think about your ancestor and where they were from and who they were, but start to think about the connections in their lives. It's For some of you, that's a little bit of a different paradigm or a different way to look at genealogy. Um, some of you have, are new to this and you've just, you've jumped right in, which is exciting, and you've started building your tree and, um, and following the records, and that's great, but when you hit what we call a brick wall, when you can't find information out about your ancestor, some of these really simple methodologies like looking at the neighbors become critical to making sure you've got the right person. So pay attention to who they're traveling with, who they're going to join. Um, so there was what we call cluster migration, which is people who traveled together. And then there's what we call chain migration, which means one or two families from an area may have migrated from a place, to a, from a place in Ireland to a place in the United States. But then, you know, six months, a year, 18 months later, another two or three families may have come from the same place to the same place. And then a few months later, another few families. That's what we call chain migration. So, so get real familiar with the names of those neighbors and friends and then look for some of those people on passenger lists to see if your ancestor didn't say where they were from, maybe one of those other people did. Um, in later passenger lists, it also records who they left behind, who their nearest relative was, uh, and sometimes it even lists their very address, and that's always exciting if you can find that. Now, um, here is kind of the, the key to opening up Irish research. Um, Irish research, one of the unique things about it is that you, you can't just know they were from Ireland. You need to know where in Ireland they were from. That's really important to make sure, A, that you have the right person, um, but B, that you're actually able to get access to the records that you need to find out more about your family history. So, so the two things that you should always be on the lookout for as you're looking at all these other records, census records, naturalization records, passenger lists, some of the other records we're gonna talk about here in just a minute, Always be on the lookout for a county and or a town name in Ireland. That's an important key. And don't just take one reference to it and say, oh, you know, this, I found a record that says that my ancestor was from County Cork and off you go. No, look for um, some corroborating evidence. Look for additional references to that location to make sure that you've got the right, um, the right information. So let's talk about um, some ways that you can think broader than just your immigrant ancestor. And like I mentioned, this is probably like a 200 level um, genealogy course, but it's a, something that we can all start thinking about and certainly something I can use a reminder about more often. Um, so hopefully you're not just looking for your immigrant ancestor, you're also looking for information about their spouse, including uh, her maiden name. So whether he married her here in the United States or whether he married her in Ireland before he left, um, having her maiden name is going to be a critical piece of information for you. Now, 
There are a lot of ways you can find women's maiden names. Um, I actually did a whole video on it. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can search for, um, I think it's called Finding Women's Maiden Names. Um, but you know, look at the children. Um, look at the children's birth certificates if you can get your hands on them or christening records. Look at death records for those children, death certificates, obituaries. Those sometimes list made, mother's maiden name. Look at what they named each of their, ch their children. Sometimes um, they would give the mother's maiden name as a middle name to one of those children. So look for those kinds of clues, and there are a lot of, a lot of other clues, but, but don't just focus on your immigrant ancestor um, or that immigrant couple. Make sure you get her maiden name where possible. Um, then look at those children and grandchildren. I just gave you a couple of examples why that might be important, but um, start to think not just about their ch in the context of their children, but start to think in context of those grandchildren as well. Um, look for maybe some naming patterns, and not that there is a set naming pattern, but just, you know, if you see that three or four of the children gave their children the same first name, maybe that's a clue to what um, one of the grandparents' names might be. Again, look for um, surnames given as middle names. That might be a clue to what a mother or a grandmother's maiden name is. Doesn't mean that it, that's what it is, but you're looking for clues. That's what we're doing right now. Also keep in mind that um, even if you're immigrant, even if you don't have a single record from your that immigrant or that immigrant couple that says where in Ireland they were from, there may, may be some record from the children or grandchildren that does. Um, we'll talk here in just a minute about specific kinds of records that do, but, but keep in mind, you need to be tracing those children and those grandchildren as well, not just your ancestor who was a descendant of your immigrant ancestor. Make sure you fill out that whole family really, really well. Also look for siblings. Now this gets, um, for some of you this is a little bit tricky, but here's what I want you to start thinking of. Even if you don't know the name of your immigrant's parents, you may know the name of one or two of their siblings. So oftentimes, um, a sibling, you know, like a, a man and his wife would immigrate to the United States with his, you know, 23-year-old single brother, and they would come to the same place in, you know, Pennsylvania or Ohio, and, you know, then the brother would marry somebody here in the United States. So you may not know the name of their parents yet. You may not have figured that out or have enough information, but you do know the name of a brother or a sister or some sibling go ahead and record that information. So the easiest way to do that in your online tree on Ancestry or in Family Tree Maker is, or the way that I do it, is that I, I enter a father with just a last name. Because obviously I don't know the father's, um, the father of this immigrant. I don't know his first name yet. I certainly don't know his wife's name yet. But I know that he most likely had the same last name as his two sons. And so I'll just enter a father with nothing but a last name and then I can add children to him. So now what I'm doing is I'm creating this family group with siblings. Again, that becomes important because when you start to identify groups of people who are connected to each other, it makes it more likely that you'll be tracing the accurate family when you get into Irish records. Also, and again, for some of you, this is a new way to think, but start tracing nieces and nephews. If you know one or two of the siblings, look at their children and grandchildren. Because maybe your immigrant ancestor's records, maybe even his children's records, don't ever list where he's from in Ireland. But maybe he has a niece who has that information written down somewhere. Or maybe she has, you know, he has a nephew who you know, ran for public office and there was a little biography written about him in a newspaper and it listed that his father was from a specific town you know, in you know, Donegal or, you know, right? So that's the kind of thing that you're looking for. So build these complete family groups out of as much information as you can collect here in the United States and be willing to go forward a generation or two because that might be exactly the key that you need to get back another generation or two. Now, this is, this is maybe the 300 level <laughs> genealogy research idea, but stick with me if this is something you haven't done before. Um, we talked earlier about paying attention to um, who else was on the passenger list, 
who the neighbors were in the census. There are other things you need to be looking for in the ways of friends and neighbors and associates. Um, look for people who were witnesses, maybe on marriage records or on children's baptismal records. Look for people who might have been um, sponsors. Look for, look for who they did deals with. When your ancestor got here to the United States, did they purchase property? Was there a land deed? Was there some kind of a transaction? Who did they buy that land from? Maybe they bought that land from somebody from the same town in Ireland who had immigrated two or three or five years earlier. So start to collect that kind of information. Now, for my purposes, I keep spreadsheets of this. These are not at least usually not um, family members. So there's not really a place for them in the family tree. However, they are connected. And so I start to record information about their names and the type of records that they show up in. Sometimes if they're witnesses or sponsors on you know, naturalization records or if they're sponsors on some kind of a church record, sometimes they are related. I just haven't figured it out yet. Um, in one case, the witness on a naturalization record that I was looking at, I recorded his name in a spreadsheet and kept that. Well, all of a sudden up pops this um, woman who was married to this man, and I discovered that her maiden name was the same as my immigrant's maiden name. So that witness ended up being a brother-in-law. At the time, I didn't know that, but I had recorded his name in a spreadsheet so that I was able to go back to it when something familiar came up and say, oh yeah, you know, here's that same name again. So start to collect some of that information. Like I said, I do it in spreadsheets. I like to be as paperless as possible. If you're a little bit more tactile and you need more, um, you know, print things out, make notes, maybe start a file folder or a binder to keep track of that information. But all of this is going to be necessary in some cases to get to the specific location where your immigrant ancestor was from. Now let's talk just briefly, we'll spend um, a lot of time talking on, on Thursday about Irish records in particular, but let's talk about what US, other U.S. records are going to help you find a location in Ireland where your family is from. Remember, that's what you're trying to get to. Not just that they were Irish, not just that they were from County Kerry, but that they were from a specific town, if you can. So look to death records, and not just a death certificate. Um, as you may or may not know, death certificates are a fairly new phenomenon. Um, many, many states in the United States did not start issuing those until the early 1900s. But there are other kinds of death records. Um, so think about obituaries. Now you may think your ancestor was a poor farmer and there was nothing of note about them, but some of those small town newspapers, even back, I've seen obituaries as early as um, the 1820s, some of those small town newspapers printed obituaries whenever anyone local died because it was news. So um, look to see. Uh, we have newspapers online. You can find them in the card catalog. If you're not familiar with how the card catalog works, you just hover over search. It's that bottom option there. Click on card catalog. And then over here in the left-hand side, you can filter to newspapers. And then you can filter by location specifically. So I could click on US. I could filter down to Ohio. A lot of Irish immigrants ended up there in the mid, eight, mid to late 1800s. And then I could click on the specific county in Ohio that I'm interested in. And this will show me the, in this case, four newspaper titles that we have on Ancestry.com for that location. I can click on any one of those and then I can come over here and see what date range that, that title covers. So don't, don't search until you've looked to see if the date range you need is here. If it's not, then you just go back to your list here and check the next title. Sometimes newspapers were only published for a few years. Sometimes um, they were published only weekly. This was a weekly paper. Sometimes they were published a couple times a month. Sometimes they were published three days a week. But this little calendar here on any one of these newspaper titles will tell you exactly the years that were covered and then the issues that, that have survived or that we have available. So look for newspaper um, records and, and obituaries in particular. Look for an actual image of the tombstone. If you can't find it on Find a Grave, maybe put a request up there to have some, if you know where they're buried, to have someone go take a picture of that tombstone. 
Um, oftentimes, our Irish ancestors, um, many of them were very proud of where they came from, not just where that they came from Ireland, but where in Ireland they came from. And so very often that information is recorded right on their tombstone, even if it's not recorded maybe in an obituary or some other record. Also, um, and I don't know how many of you know this, but sometimes funeral homes or even cemeteries have more records than just what's on the tombstone. So be willing to reach out to them and see if they have other records. Maybe they have a clipping of the obituary in a file. Maybe they have a copy of the death certificate. Maybe they have some kind of a notation. on a, um, I've seen cards um, at cemeteries that have been filled out by the family members when they were ordering the plot and ordering the, the headstone or the gravestone. So funeral homes and cemeteries have excellent records that may have more information than, you'll, than you're able to find elsewhere. We talked about newspapers for, or for obituaries, but also be willing to look at newspapers for other information. I mentioned earlier this immigrant who was running, um, there was a, a nephew who was running for office. And so, so the newspaper did a little write-up about this man because he was running for public office. And so even though he wasn't an immigrant, and even though he was the nephew of my immigrant, right there in that little newspaper write-up about him, it listed that his father had immigrated from a very specific town in Ireland, you know, 10 years before he was born and had lived in that community that this man had been born and lived in that community his whole life. And, um, and so really specific information can sometimes be included in newspaper articles, even if you don't think your immigrant did anything of note, um, maybe they had other family members who did. So newspaper articles are very valuable. And then the last um, record that I just want to highlight today is um, local histories. Now, local histories are kind of an interesting thing. Um, in 1876, when the United States was celebrating its 100th anniversary or birthday, um, uh, uh, the 100th anniversary of our independence, the the, there was kind of this call put out for communities to write a history of their town or of their county. And so from about 1876 until about 1920, 1930, a lot of these local histories were written. Ancestry.com has, um, I haven't checked lately, but I think it's something like 30,000 of them. Um, maybe not that many, but we have, we have a lot of them um, that have been published and put online. So even if, again, even if your specific ancestor isn't mentioned, maybe one of those friends or associates might be mentioned. Now you're going to find those again in the card catalog if you just click on stories, memorials, and histories. And then there's um, a couple of different categories here. You can look at social and place histories. That's probably going to be your most um, beneficial one for our purposes. But then there's some other kinds of histories written there, so you might want to explore those. So I could click on social and place histories. Again, I can filter by location down to the specific place. So this time let's go to let's go to West Virginia. And I'm going to look specifically at Brook County, West Virginia. So there is one history, Brook County, West Virginia to 1882. That means that that particular history was probably published in 1882. And then I can search for my ancestor. Always check and see if there's a browse box over here. In this case, there's not. But in, in the case where we actually have been able to digitize a copy of the book, um, you can actually read it. Just click on browse over here and read it page by page just like you would a book. Again, keep in mind those local histories may mention your immigrant ancestor by name or they may mention one of the siblings or nephews or grandchildren. So don't search for your ancestor, just do a search in that specific title for their last name and see what comes up. Then maybe do a search for some of those friends and associates that you've identified, see if any of them come up. Um, and if there's a little biography about them, you might get lucky and find um, very specific information about where in Ireland they're from. Okay, in our last few minutes today, let me just um, give you some some prep for Thursday's presentation, and then I'm actually going to give you homework. I don't do that ever, but um, for those of you who are here today, I hope you'll join us again on Thursday, and I'm going to give you a little bit of homework so that you're ready for that presentation. So um, the first thing I'm just going to warn you about when you're talking about challenges of Irish research is, if you didn't know this, <laughs> 
very common names, you know, Mary Sullivan and John O'Brien and Catherine O'Connell and even my great, great, great grandfather, George Cowan. That may not sound like a very terribly common name, but it it's, might be more common than you think, especially in Ireland. So just be prepared for the fact that these names might be very common. And so it's critical that you start to build some of these family connections, right? There may be a million John O'Briens, but there's probably only going to be one John O'Brien who had a mother named Catherine O'Sullivan and a father named Patrick. So when you start building those connections, then when you get into Irish records, you'll know you have the right person because you've built some of this family structure here. Um, another challenge for Irish research is that there was a fire in 1922 there um, that destroyed a lot of records, a lot of records, census records, birth, marriage, and death records. So there are some gaping holes in what we can do once we get into Irish records. You just need to be prepared for that. Um, unlike in England and Scotland, who began civil registration of their birth, marriage, and death um, records fairly early, civil registration in Ireland didn't begin until 1864. Um, there is um, a little bit of a dearth of some early church records. So if you've done research in, Ir or in English records, you know sometimes those church records, those parish records go way back um, into the 1600s, in some cases the 1500s, and sometimes they contain quite a bit of information. But in Ireland, that's not necessarily the case. So um, be, be aware of that. Also, the, um, the place names uh, can be really unfamiliar to us. They can also be spelled or misspelled a variety of ways. So if your ancestor said they were from a certain location or a certain town, whoever wrote that may have just written it the best way they knew how. Um, if it was a, a name that had some Gaelic influence or, um, you know, could have been spelled a variety of ways, they may have gotten it way wrong. So always pay attention to that county name as well as that town name and pay attention to the different ways that it may show up in different records. Just some, some things to be aware of. Now with that, I give you that information again to set proper expectations, not to scare you away. It is still very possible to do Irish research. Um, people have been very successful at it. But you want to make sure that when you start diving into those Irish records that you're tracing the right family. And all of this work that you can do ahead of time into U.S. records, into building some of those family structures, into collecting as much information as possible is only going to make you more successful when you dive into those Irish records. With that said, let me give you your homework assignment, okay? Um, just a little exercise that I'd like all of you to engage in before we get back together on Thursday morning to talk specifically about Irish records. So I want you to go to the card catalogs. Again, that's if you hover over search, click on card catalog, it's the bottom option there. Then I want you to scroll down to the filter for location, click on Europe, and then click on Ireland. What you're going to discover is that on Ancestry.com we have 176 databases that contain Irish records. Some of them are Irish specific records, for example, Irish Civil Registration Marriage Index from 1845 to 1958, right? Um, that database has 4.5 million records. Some of them are a little bit more broad, so for example, um, we have crawled BillionGraves.com's burial index. They have, you know, 2.8 million records, but only some of them are from Ireland. They're a worldwide um, service. So here's what I'd like you to do. Get to this list of 176 databases and just look through them. Maybe click on one or two of them that look interesting to you. Don't do any searches, but scroll down and read what we call these database descriptions. So you can get, start to get familiar with the kind of records that exist. Now, once you've done that, what I'd like you to do is write down one or two questions that come up as you do that about Irish records in particular. Um, with those questions in hand then, um, come back and join me on Thursday where we will be talking about those Irish records and hopefully your question will be answered. If it's not answered um, specifically in my presentation, then as always, if you're watching this live, you can join me on chat immediately following and ask whatever questions you have. If you're watching an archived version of this, 
on our YouTube channel, feel free to leave a question in the comments. We do monitor those and we'll respond as appropriate. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.